My text this morning comes from the Gospel of John. It is the uh, entire prologue, John 1, 1 through 18. Listen as I read God's Word. In the beginning was God, and God became flesh. It was Jesus that was in the beginning. All things came into being through him. And without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone. That was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory as a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son, who is close to the father's heart. Who has made him known. May God bless the reading of his word. What you can't see in yourself, you will never be able to see in others. I pastor a church just south of Atlanta, and this Christmas was my first ever Christmas Eve communion service. I was really excited, but it was quite the experience. I show up, everything's prepared, I light the candles, I have communion laid out on the table, everyone's pouring in, and the piano player doesn't show. He just decided to stay at home. So we sang a cappella the entire service. And then it was time for the communion to happen. So I go down front, I prepare the table, just like here, and we have the deacons come forward, we distinguish the bread and the wine, and then I realize about two-thirds of the way, as the deacons work their way to the back of the room, we did not prepare enough wine. <laughs> for my first ever Christmas Eve communion service, we ran out of wine, and that's, that'll be a memory for mine forever. That's neither here nor there. When we were in that service, I invited all the children to come down front, and I retold them the Christmas story. One of the little children had just had a baby brother, and the baby brother was just a few months old. I used him as an illustration in that service, and I told the children that this would be the size of what Jesus looked like when Jesus was born. And then I looked at him and I said that God holds Jesus in the palm of his hand, and so too does God hold you and me. The birth of Jesus allows you and me to also be God's babies. And this is one of the reasons why John's prologue is so unique to me. The narrator doesn't give us an account of Jesus' birth. Instead, the narrator comes right out and tells the reader that Jesus is more than you can imagine. This Jesus is the incarnate walking this earth, wrapping himself in our dust, eating our food and redeeming at all times. This Jesus was born baby is far more than just a baby. He's divinity intersecting with humanity, and in that intersection is changing everything. John's prologue is quite intricate as well. It's written in an ancient word scramble. If you take thought for thought, starting at the beginning and end, and you work your way towards the middle, you'll find that the thoughts have an impressive consistency. The first matches with the last, the second to the second to the last. If you work your way to the middle, you get the hinge in which the entire prologue and what I would argue the Gospel of John turns. When you work your way to the middle, you get to John 12b. But to all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gave power to become children of God. 
This is the most important message for you to receive, and I think to give others. That for those who believe in Jesus' name, who call on the name of Jesus, power is given to them to become children of God. And here we sit in the epicenter of the prologue. God enters our world, lives, uh, lives among us, and gives us love and hope and power and an opportunity to become God's babies. But as fun as this is to say, the hard truth of the matter is that we don't accept our identity as a child of God. To be a child of God would be to mimic the life of Jesus, right? While well, I look at Christians, especially in the Baptist world, and we don't love and we don't serve as well as we would like. We fight denominational wars. We cast people out for being different. We draw lines in the sand and we vote people in and out. It's our churches who decide who will be saved and it's our churches who decide who will be damned. We become tribal and we become introspective and we build a callus around anything outside of our own worldview. This is not the gift that Jesus gave us in the prologue. John says that all who call upon the name of the Lord are given power to become children of God. So why do we do it? Why do we fail to acknowledge the identity of Christ in other people? Why do we not see everyone for the holiness that they are? When I was in college, I had a good chance of... of uh, I had a great opportunity, actually, being a youth minister at a, t at a church right outside of Nashville, First Baptist of Goodlandsville. When I got there, I quickly remembered, or I quickly realized that this church has got their things and their ducks in a row. They had a pretty routine calendar, a lot of expectations. I learned that they weren't really interested in a guy coming and mixing things up. They just needed a face, and they needed someone to babysit. But at 21 years old, I was just cocky enough to think that I didn't need anyone's help. By the time a year was over, I had successfully ostracized every single one of my Sunday school leaders. All the people that said they were youth workers and helpers, they did not want to be around me at all. And when I look back on it, this memory is one of the greatest stepping stones in my ministry. The church body loved me. Give me that one. The youth group did grow a little bit in numbers, so there was some success there. But the six adults who poured their heart and soul and time into the youth group, I neglected to care for. And I never even thanked them one time. When I left the church to go to seminary, I had one of the adults write me a letter. And I will never forget what that letter said. In the letter, she said this was supposed to be the happiest year of my life. My daughter was a senior in high school about to graduate and go off to college. But your inability to include me made me feel useless and unwelcome. You're a good guy, Barrett, but you do not do a good job. I tell you this story because what drove me apart from my adult workers was my inability to care for their belovedness. I neglected to see them as a true child of God. I pushed them away. I ostracized them. I made them feel as if they didn't belong. Even the best of intentions can cause division and can cause hurt. I realize now that what you can't see in yourself, you will never be able to see in others. My inability to see myself as a child of God made it too difficult for me to recognize the belovedness of my youth workers. Henry Nouwen writes, your true identity is as a child of God. This is the identity you have to accept. Once you have claimed it and settled in it, you can live in a world that gives you much pain as well as joy. 